this is the, whether alternate history is science fiction or not, the debate. Uh, just to warn you, I'm not sure how much of a debate it's going to be, since we already sort of debated online. So we found out we're pretty much in agreement with a lot of things. But I mean, who knows, we may take it down fun little roads. Um, I guess we should introduce ourselves first, just so that you guys know why we feel uh, confident talking about the subject. Uh, Dale, do you want to go first? Uh, I'm Dale Kuzner. I, uh, I edit uh, a POD, uh, a POD, which is uh, alternate history app. Uh, I have uh, oh, I think it's to six alternate history books, uh, novels, collections uh, out there. Um, and <coughs> I've been on quite a few panels, really uh, kind of enjoy alternate history. It's kind of my uh, specialty. And there. Hi, I'm Matt Mitrovich. I don't have library books, sadly not yet, if I had the time. Uh, I have been an alternate history fan since uh, kind of pretty much freshman year of high school uh, when I read uh, World War and the Balance by Harry Turtledove. Uh, since then, I've pretty much been kind of really obsessed with the genre. Uh, I blog. Uh, on my blog, which is Alternate History Weekly Update, which is just pretty much a news review and commentary site on various different topics involving alternate history. Uh, this year I was asked to be a sidewise judge, so that was pretty cool. That was a, that was a big deal. I see somebody there who's on that too. Uh, and I, I just have uh, been a really big fan. Uh, I was, let's see other things. Oh, yeah. Um, at the Sideways in Time uh, Academic Conference at the University of Liverpool. I presented a paper on the history of the online alternate history community. So uh, I've done a lot of research and stuff. They haven't been published yet, still waiting out uh, word for that, but who knows, maybe one of these days. But uh, yeah, so uh, I, I think we got our credentials down. So the, the big question is, uh, Dale, is alternate history science fiction? Uh, yes, most of it is. And uh, the reason I say that is, first up, I can understand some doubts. It's the, the, the history is a major component of a lot of it. Um, and uh, a lot of the science behind alternate history is kind of iffy. Uh, you, you probably, I know, uh, <laughs> you, uh, when you think about it, uh, it depends mostly, most of the uh, alternate history depends on the uh, uh, idea that there are multiple universes that uh, are caused when you create, uh, when you make a decision, uh, and that's that may or may not be true. Uh, but I think it's at least as much uh, scientifically viable as uh, most space opera. It depends on there being faster than light travel. Uh, so yeah, I think it's, it's science. Uh, I'm going to go with the more, it can be science fiction, but then again, it seems a pretty versatile genre when, it kind of, when you really come down to it. I mean, certainly there's a lot of alternate history works out there that have science fiction themes, such as you know, time travel or parallel dimensions, uh, aliens, and other things like that. But then oftentimes you run into alternate history books that have uh, vampires taking over England by uh, Mary and Queen Victoria. Uh, you have uh, magical detectives, you have uh, things like that, and then you have works that forgo all the uh, science fiction and fantasy elements we're familiar with, and pretty much just read like straight historical fiction, where it's just history's different. That's it. There's, someone made a different decision one day, and other, otherwise there's nothing really, uh, at least from a fantastical angle, different with our world. The same rules still apply. Uh, Aliens exist, we certainly don't know about it yet. If there is such a thing as magic, we, no one can really use it. It's just history that played out a little differently. These can range from JFK surviving his assassination. These can range from uh, someone not losing uh, their orders at the, uh, in the Civil War and suddenly a battle goes differently, uh, which ends up with the Confederate States of America as the Nazi analog. But you know, you got the, all these things, and sometimes they make sense, at least if you, you know, study history, and maybe when they don't make sense, they could be considered science fiction or just fantasy, but at the same time, there's none of those elements. And that being said, you know, it's often, you know, I don't know, Dale, when you want to describe, when someone asks you what alternate history is, what do you usually describe it as? Do you just really say, yes, it's a science fiction, or do you put some more details in that? 
Uh, well, I, I think it's yeah, a lot of it is science fiction. Uh, there is an element of it that's, uh, for example, I don't know, you've probably read, uh, heard of virtual history uh, and a, uh, a couple others that were actually written by historians that used it as a tool for trying to understand history better. And there was really no element of fiction there. So it, it's ultimate history, but it's not, that definitely is not science fiction, uh, uh, per se. Uh, there's no story, there's no. Uh, character that, get, that is changed by it, uh, no plot really other than the history. And some of, to be honest with you, some of Terry Turtle does approach that because uh, really the characters exist to, to, to tell you about the history. And, and, I mean, you know, there's plenty of characters and their uh, point of view characters and, uh, you know, and, and they really do just exist to, to tell the history. Uh, yeah, another term for virtual history is also like counterfactual history. Um, actually, recently, uh, Richard Evans, who's this famous British historian, uh, wrote a whole uh, book on, uh, as a criticism of counterfactual history called Ultra Pass. So, the guys, it's, again, it's a criticism of counterfactual history, but it actually does a really good job describing uh, alternate history and counterfactual history and also has invalid criticism sometimes, too. Uh, one of my, I remember reading, I wrote a review for it. And I said that, yeah, a lot of stuff he said was pretty on the mark, but my big issue was it had already been said before. He wasn't really saying anything new, and that was my big issue with a lot of people who jumped on the, yeah, counterfactual history sucks bandwagon with Richard, was it's like, this isn't anything new. People who have been playing around in alternate history for years have been saying this same goddamn thing. Like, sometimes people are motivated by their own political bias, so that's when they create an alternate history, they turn the world the way they want to see the world. Some people might even be doing it because they're unhappy with the present. Yeah, that's a, that's a generalized genre that happens all the time. And you can almost argue every single genre of fiction is like that, whether it be science fiction, fantasy, just literary history. People are writing stories, often sometimes, and they might have a political axe to grind, or they might have some bias that's playing out. Um, but sort of getting back into the whole whether alternate history is science fiction, I've often found it easier just to, when people say alternate history, is I'd say, oh, it's a subgenre of science fiction, uh, just because that's the easiest way to explain it. And you gotta be careful, to, I, I found at times, because I had one point when uh, someone asked me, you know, what's alternate history? And before I could even answer, they went, is that like conspiracy theories and things like that? And I'm like, no, 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 nothing like that, nothing like that. We, we mess with history. We change history in the way that as we know it. We don't pretend that there's a secret agenda and there's you know some sinister lurking force behind the scenes, you know, directing history. That's for a whole other type of people to deal with, and I don't want to get into that really much. But it's sort of like you know we got to remember too when we're talking about the history, we're talking about changing all history, changing history as the way we know it, uh, and that's a, a really big deal. But when you talk about history so much, again, it comes back to why, you know, I think in some ways alternate history probably is more common with historical fiction than science fiction, just because historical fiction often has a lot of, well, fiction in it. There's people who are participating in a historical events who aren't real, and some of them even go far enough giving them an actual, like, if they weren't there, this fictional character, such and such a person uh, wouldn't uh, be able to do a thing. I mean, yeah, God, I can't remember the name, but there's a bunch of these, like, there's a cartoon on PBS where a bunch of these kids were involved in the American Revolution, and they just kept being a present at certain events. Does anybody remember that cartoon, or am I crazy? I remember it, but I don't remember the title. Yeah. Liberty something. L Liberty oh, Kids. Liberty Kids, Liberty. Yeah, yeah. And Johnny Tremaine was pretty similar, too. Yeah. Which was a Disney movie. But you wouldn't say that's technically alternate history, just because there's fictional characters. History pretty much stays the same. It's historical Yeah. But at the same time, it's hard to label every single book that, that all this alternate history as science fiction, in my opinion. So I've been talking too long. Here, Bill. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we uh, we see a lot in alternate history, and uh, I guess it's probably true uh, of a lot of uh, a lot of other things. But uh, it's uh, I think Jim Rittenhouse uh, yes. <laughs> uh, called it uh, "If Only History." Uh, and I'll, uh, in other words, uh, maybe it did, I think it didn't, but uh, the idea is that if only this had happened, then the world would be such a so much better place. And a typical thing, uh, well, if, the, if we had just left the Germans and the Russians alone, they would uh, basically avoid each other down the stubs, and then the U.S. would have 
control the world and it would all be everything would all be wonderful. Except that millions and millions of people would be dying. Yeah, would be dead exactly. just because of how they were born. So I'm not sure yeah. how great a world that would be. Yeah, exactly. Life. That's the that's the that's the point. If, when you're talking, if only you, you look at the. Uh, uh, you don't look at the downsides of it, and, and a, another one. And this is this is kind of this is probably uh, this is kind of arguable. But a lot of people look at the uh, Kennedy assassination, and if only he had not died, then and, and they fill in the blanks. It, it's it's sort of like a ink blot test. Okay, he would have done exactly what I, in hindsight, wish had happened, and and, and that may it may or may not be true. But it's not, yeah. You know, obviously, he's, he was a, he was a man. He's not gonna make. He wasn't gonna make the perfect insight in hindsight decisions. And uh, yeah, so you gotta be. Uh, I don't know. That, that, that's one of the things about alternate history. You gotta be a little bit careful not to uh, impose your uh, ideals in hindsight on. Uh, what would have happened? Uh, I, I, uh, that was one of the things Ferguson, uh, the, uh, in virtual history, talked about. Or he did, I, in my opinion, is he he did an English Civil War alternative, and everything just went beautifully uh, after that. And, and you, know, you, you know, realistically, history goes down some dark roads, uh, and, and ultimately, history probably is going to too. Yeah, in fact, I'm big. I think, as a general rule, history, alternate history tends to, uh, and you, can, you don't disagree with me on this one, but tends to lean toward uh, the pes be very pessimistic, be very kind of almost lean toward the dystopia. There's a lot of alternate history works, some famous ones, where because history was different, the world in many ways is actually worse. Part of that, I think, might be because World War II alternate histories are so popular, so most of those end up with the Nazis winning. So yeah, that's going to be a really bad world. But it seems like even with other sort of like uh, points of emergence that come up every once in a while, it seems like it tends to like, if the Americans use the revolution, obviously the world's gonna be an awful place because the British control North America. But then again, would it really honestly be, or is it just, again, it's, you know, this whole idea of American exceptionalism, if you get rid of that, the world's a worse place kind of thing. Um, we are not really discussing whether alternate history is science fiction. We're pretty much just talking about what alternate history is. So, um, but then again, I guess it, I'm, I guess that's the whole point. If you read if you read the description of this panel, it's like does it really matter? Eh, probably not. You know, it's it's still a fun genre to play in. You got a question? Yeah. Well, I was just going to comment on the earlier thing. Uh, don't know if you've read any of H. B. Being Piper's, uh, but he had his alternate history. He had alternate historians in his paratemple, and they were all split along this ism of the uh, great man versus the inexorability of, uh, of the force of the thing, which it seemed to apply to what you were describing a little earlier. Well, yeah, the whole great man theory, that's like often like a common debate among ultra historians. Like, I think a lot of ultra historians in general believe that we can make big changes, that one human being can make big changes. Uh, I'm not sure if that really means that they believe in certain people who are destined to make those great changes, but just it's sort of the argument that one person, by just taking a different step down the road, can lead to massive changes down, down the way. Uh, at the same time, though, some would argue that even if you change history, it's kind of hard to change facts all that much. Uh, like, there's been a lot of talk about killing baby Hitler, so it's like, all right, maybe if you killed baby Hitler, you could avoid the Holocaust in World War II, or did Hitler, before he became chancellor, really have all that effect on history? Would he have event? Would would World War One and all of the Great Depression and all the stuff still play out, missing him? And would somebody else just rise up? And just because that different person may be a little bit smarter than him, he might not be able to get Germany the navy it needed to invade Britain. So it's like, what do you really change? Germany might, might have already been in a position to to lose, or then again, who knows? Maybe someone in, in the different spot could make things a little different. Oh, here, I'm pass that to you. Um, I have this uh, slightly different perspective on the Great Man uh, thing. I think that history is kind of uh, sounds kind of dorky, but history is kind of like a, a river. You, you got some places, you got really high banks. It's going to go where it's going to go. Uh, and I think that the uh, after about uh, probably about December seventh, nineteen forty-one, World War II was going to pretty much go the way it was going to go. Uh, 
there were times in history where you know, just a, a few determined men could re really make a difference. And uh, uh, those I kind of, it's kind of like the river spread out in the pine and it, it, it's looking to cut, it could cut a channel here, it could cut a channel there. Uh, and a, a case of, uh, one of the places where that's true is uh, Europe after World War I with, with the fall of Austria-Hungary and the Russian uh, and the Russian Tsars and, uh, and Imperial Germany. A few thousand determined men could make a huge difference. One leader, Lenin, could make a huge difference there. Uh, another thing, I think, uh, yeah, if you're into World War II, the very early stages of World War, uh, the lead up to World War II, uh, there were a lot of options there, but once you get to the point where you get uh, Germany and Japan fighting the US, Russia, uh, or the Soviets and Britain, it's pretty much back to, there's a chance it's not going to go much, but much uh, different places. Yeah, uh, you talked about one, one man can make a difference. I can think of one person, George Marshall. If he hadn't pushed through the Marshall Plan in Europe, it would not have given the Europeans as many options. And the Soviet Union uh, could have pushed a lot of elections so they'd be communist leaders. And it would have been a quite a different place. So there's one, one case where one man makes a difference. Well, true, that was, he was, and I look like back in hindsight that, yeah, he was right to do that because things were really bad in Europe at the time. And if the United States didn't step in with the financial aid, things could have gone a lot worse. That being said, I mean, George Marshall was only one man. He still needed the help of Harry Truman to sell it, obviously, oh, as well. Yeah, well. I mean, that comes like, yeah, one man can definitely make a difference, but he still needs that network of support to sometimes get his ideas through, obviously. Well, as I understand it, Marshall was the one that uh, pretty much engineered the plan, so. Someone else might have taken his place, but would it would it have worked? That's a good question. I mean, you could argue, like I said, my argument is that you need a network of people seeing that Marshall needed people to agree with him, and those same people have put in his place might have come with the idea on their own, and they might have done the same thing. It's a whole argument about whether there really is such a thing as great men who are the only ones who can do it, or whether they like they're using Dale's. Uh, uh, analogy, whether it, history is just a river, and if, if it wasn't Marshall who came to the surface, it would have been somebody else. And again, I don't know. That's a thing. No one of us really know. We can talk into her, uh, you know, blue in the face, and neither one of us might convince the other person. I'm not even really arguing with you. I'm taking the, I'm being devil's advocate just for sake of conversation, obviously. It's just that that, that whole, that, that ongoing debate between alternate alternate historians, it's like, do we really have control, or are we just all just being pushed along? If one of us happens to leave, history doesn't really change all that much. Um, okay, there's a lot of people. I'm gonna go back there. Yeah, um, I would go to uh, uh, Asimov's foundation series and his concept of psychohistory, which would argue that yes, history is a river, that yes, there are places along that line if you can apply the right pressure at the right point in time in that river, you can all the course. And I think that his point, Mark George R. Marshall was one, I'd say Alexander the Great, there probably was nobody else who was going to do what he did, which created the Hellenistic world, forget what it, the fact that he didn't build the empire. Uh, you look at uh, Julius Caesar, uh, you look at Marshall, you look at, at Lincoln, <coughs> I think we can look at a number of characters over here who have done exactly what Asimov was talking about in the Foundation series, which has moved that river in a way that other people might have attempted to do that, but they didn't have the, they weren't the right person in the right place at the right time. Anybody else at a different point in time would have had no effect. We put Lincoln maybe 10 years earlier, and we probably wouldn't have heard of him. Uh, I would, I have, uh, uh, I'll, I'll go to questions. Uh, I just have a quick comment. Um, I think that probably uh, one of the things about great men, uh, and the, or actually the people that really influence history, we might not know about a lot of them. I mean, the Alexander the Great, yeah, uh, a few others, but uh, I, I would say, it's especially the people that invented technology, a lot of them, who were they? You know? uh, I mean, okay, t take, take a look at this way. Uh, when we were, uh, when, uh, when it was, uh, when my great uh, grandparents, about 1900s, were around, uh, most of the population was rural. 
Uh, women worked in a, uh, mostly, in men and women worked mostly in farms. Uh, and the transition to manufacturing, what? Who did that? You know, I mean, that was a huge tidal wave of, of things uh, that, of change. And, and uh, women moving into the workforce, that was a huge tidal wave of change. And to a large extent, who did that? Well, probably the people that designed the, uh, the home efficiency things that, uh, that made it possible for a woman's work to be, to go from you know, eight hour a day to, uh, you know, to a two hour day and the rest of the time, uh, you know, allowed a, a, a unit to be, uh, a family unit to be uh, two working people uh, outside the home rather than one, <coughs> than one working full time in the home and one working full time out of the home. But who did that? You know, it, probably some the, the people that did that were very important. They were great people, but we don't know. I, don't, I have no idea who invented the microwave, who invented the uh, who invented the home appliances like dishwasher, dryers, uh, that sort of thing. I have no clue. I guess it's sort of like people they become the, the, the great men and women of history become great after the fact when people can look back and be like, oh yeah, they did really great things. But at the time, how many people? let's say 10 years before Lincoln was elected, how many people could look at Lincoln and be like, oh yeah, this guy is definitely going places. This backcountry uh, attorney from Illinois who's lost multiple elections. Who, who thought this guy was gonna be the one who pulled, pulled uh, the country uh, back together? That's the kind of the thing. I mean, I mean there's, you get these people at times, if you really go back to time when they were contemporary, when you actually look at them, I mean, going back to Marshall and Truman, for example, uh, it was actually a pretty big deal when Truman got elected president because he was just some no-name guy with barely any money to his name from Missouri. Uh, he grew up, he lived in Missouri, his family lived in Missouri back when it was still considered frontier. You know, the, his life, his, when he was born, he was not far removed from when Missouri was the West. This isn't, we're not, we're not talking about California or Wyoming or, or Nevada, we're talking about when Missouri was the West. And that's pretty <coughs> crazy. And this is a guy who succeeded, of all people, FDR, a guy who had held the presidency for how many years was it? Oh, the four term. Let's go with that. Uh, uh, you know what I'm saying? This is a guy who didn't come from the elite. This was a guy who didn't have his name. This was just the, an average Joe kind of president. He could have crashed and burned horribly, and many people expected him to. And many, and he pulled, and he pulled it off. And none of people, you know, looking back on it now, we can say like a lot of the things he did kind of helped us survive the Cold War, helped us win the Cold War. And a lot of people, though. Disagree with them. People are still disagree today. There's still people online who be like, "Yeah, we should have had MacArthur nuke the Chinese. Yeah, that would have been great." <laughs> Looking back at it now, we see how that stupid idea that was. But at the time, MacArthur had a lot of popular support. Probably in some cases, more popular support than the president. We have a, a lady with her hand up back there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, I question was less about details, but more from a publishing idea. Can argue about whether or not science fiction or altered the history of science fiction, but why is it in the science fiction section? I mean, there was a book that came out um, a while back and it had a sequel. It was called What If? And that was marketed in the history area. And every once in a while, you'll see a few books like that, and they call them counter. They don't call it all history. They call it counterfactuals yeah. on that side. And it's like, but why is all this? You think that, like you say, it should be in the historical fiction area, but it's not. You're lucky that there's a science fiction area to put it in. <laughs> the, 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 product, the, the bookstores just put product out there. Limited is just exactly how many places they can put things in a particular section for forever. And yet they put the, all the history stuff. They in. don't understand what they're peddling. Well, I think a lot of what happens is they put the, the um, like, uh, what if and uh, virtual history? That's actual. That's not. There's no fiction really in it. It's uh, it's, uh, it's just it's the, his, the history behind an alternate history without the actual story. So I think that so they pretty much have to. If they're going to put it anywhere, it's going to be in uh, in history. Uh, as to why alternate history is a group of historical fiction, that might be partly a historical accident. But uh, one of the uh, first alternate history, or arguably alternate history, was uh, uh, Sideways of Time, I believe, uh, or he was uh, Langster. Uh, it's basically, it, the idea behind that was that all of a sudden we had a uh, 
called it, I believe, a time quake. And all of a sudden, there was a jumble of histories. Uh, we had a Roman, Roman legion, or part of one, uh, confronting a, a car. And uh, uh, people going uh, across the state line, and suddenly they're in the Confederacy. And uh, the, yeah, or a Viking timeline. Uh, and because he was a, what's that? What was the name? It was a, it's actually a story, uh, a novelette or novella uh, called uh, Sideways in Time. It's actually the, yeah. And it's actually the, uh, the basis for uh, the uh, Sideways of Lawyers, I believe. Is that correct, John? That's right. And then you got like works like uh, Bring the Jubilee, which uh, involves this guy who's living in uh, a world where the Confederacy won the Civil War. And then he eventually gets working with this institute. And he wants to study history, he wants to be able to study it exactly. And luckily for them, they have someone invented a time machine. So he can go back in time and view history as it happened. And because he's obsessed with the Battle of Gettysburg, which Lee won and won the war, he goes back in time to that, accidentally causes some troops to do something differently, and suddenly the Union won. And now he's stuck in our history. And you get, but that, again, it's the time travel, this time quake. And a lot of these early works of fiction, uh, of alternate history fiction, were sort of, again, science fiction. They had these science fiction elements. So again, so it's that kind of historical accident. Because they had all these science fiction elements, it was just easier to put them into science fiction. In fact, it wasn't a debate because, uh, time travel, science fiction. Time quake, science fiction. But then you get like works like The Man in the High Castle by Philip K. Dick. And there really isn't any time travel. There's no parallel universes. There's no aliens. There's no magic. It's just you're in a world where uh, you're in a world where the Nazis won. And you have this book, The Grasshopper Lies Heavy, which shows a world where the Allies won, except the world is locked in a Cold War between the United States and the British Empire. It's an alternate history within an alternate history. And so you get all these different levels. But there's, no, there's nothing fantastical about it. And that's, I think, around that time. And there were books before that did that, but never to the level of popularity as Dick. And that's the time uh, when things became a little bit more complicated. When you had alternate history that was not really science fiction, and so it became hard to, to put it wherever, but uh, it's still because of how the earlier works were categorized and labeled, it got moved into science fiction. We have a question over there. Uh, is it a historiographical glitch that I frequently find in even the best done great man uh, alternate history, uh, people have, the authors have not done their homework on all of the different abilities that the aforesaid great man uh, had, and they tend to stick with just the one for which he is best known. Classic example being Robert E. Lee, who is seen as a genius as a field commander. Before the Civil War, he had never commanded troops in the field. Uh, he was an engineer, and a very good one. Suppose he'd gone north of the Union and been made chief of ordnance. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, there's um, a lot of, yeah, a lot of the, uh, Alternate history is very superficial. It takes, you know, like, like you say, one characteristic. Uh, but you know, the one thing uh, I think answered to your question partly is uh, it's in science fiction because uh, it's written by a lot of it's written by science fiction authors, and so it's yeah. And from a selling standpoint, if you're going to uh, if some of these known as a science fiction author like well, Harry Turtledove. Uh, and he's also an alternate history author. It makes sense to put uh, put his books where people are going to find it, as no, opposed no. to Els Monkey Trail. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In fact, I have his book on the Scopes Monkey Trail. Also, it's, a, it's something interesting to point out that you know a lot of literary authors don't like any of their works being labeled science fiction. I mean, we can probably think of a, a few of them who get really upset if you say that. But the one genre you're going to see literary authors, the one science fiction genre you're going to see literary authors tackle is alternate history. Because somehow it's more acceptable to change history than it is to have spaceships and aliens and all that kind of stuff. And that's okay. They'll never call it science fiction, certainly. They won't even call it alternate history. You know, Philip Roth, you know, I, I think just thought he discovered this genre. It's like, oh, this is a great idea. I don't believe why anyone didn't think about this before. But he did his whole, like, oh, God, I can't remember. What was the name of Phil Rothbard? What did he wrote from history? I can't remember. Really 
Yeah, it's the one about um, uh, Merlinda becomes president. Yeah, Charles Merlinda becomes president. I can't remember the name of it. The Plot Against America. Yes. There we go. I knew I was going to think of it eventually. And you see, like, a lot of other literary authors, when they're interviewed about this, they act like no one's ever done this before. Even Stephen King, who should know a little bit better, <laughs> he, even he acted like this is something he created. And it's just like, you do know there's other people who have written about this, right? You're not the first person. And, you know, King is a type of and I talk about how much of a nerd he is sometimes. You read some of his, like, memoirs and things about his life. And yet, you've never heard of any of this kind of stuff before? You know, he talks about, he, it, it, just, it just blows the mind sometimes, it really does. Um, I just had a comment back to the popularity of the great math theory. It was, it was way back in the conversation. Um, one is that uh, the great man theory provides, or you know, provides a hero for our people to, to relate to, and you'll be likely to have a hero. And the other thing is, it's probably easier to sell if it's about paper handling than then it's about chocolate. That's very true, and you can also make the argument it's not easier to sell. Uh, parts of history that people think they know. Not that they actually know, because there's plenty of people who will say, oh, of course the Civil War was fought not because of slavery, because of taxes. I, I don't want to start that argument, so I don't care if you think that's wrong, I, I don't care. Uh, uh, and, but that's, that's the thing, people like to think they know history, but they only know certain parts, and so they only really want to read about things they recognize. People know George Washington, you know, so they might pick up a book where George Washington uh, helps negotiate a peace with Britain and then the revolution. Uh, people think they know about Robert E. Lee, so they want to read about the Civil War. People think they know about uh, Rommel, so they want to read about World War II. Uh, JFK, you know, obviously, but no one really wants to know about uh, some no-name general who led the American forces in the Mexican-American War. Who cares? Yeah. You know, it's like, uh, I, I probably bet that most people, no one in this room, so please, I'm being very general with this, most people probably wouldn't be able to name a single battle in the Mexican-American War. So yeah. it's like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> but this one was exceptional. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Would you consider a Brave New World to be alternate history or just a science fiction? I, I, I honestly don't know. I, it's not a great thing. Uh, but there are a lot of. Uh, the Brave New World took place in the future. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's a that's a they yeah. posited changes in their past, which are still our future. And that's an interesting question. Um, I used to uh, sometimes call uh, old future histories kind of honorary alternate history. Like uh, there was a. Uh, uh, Really interesting thing. In, uh, it was written in the late 1920s. Uh, it's called the Red Napoleon, and uh, the uh, uh, they basically had the Soviet Union. Uh, Stalin gets assassinated. Somebody else takes his place. He's like a, a Napoleon type, and they come very close to taking over the world. And, and it's uh, uh, so it, it obviously it didn't happen, but it was, at the time it was future history. Uh, we have something to debate because I hate that term on our history. I hate it when people take science fiction that has become obsolete and suddenly it's now alternate history because wait a second, alternate history isn't a dumping ground for fiction. It's I always like the idea that you have to pretty much set out to create alternate history. There are certain kind of rules you almost need to follow. There are certain things you need to do. Just because you wrote about the future and suddenly that future the, the time for, the time period caught up with it and passed it up and suddenly it wasn't right. <laughs> That's not alternate history. Let's take a good example of a recent one, too, Back to the Future. Uh, in Back to the Future 2, of course, that part when they go to the alternate 1985, where Nixon's won multiple terms and this one's an evil empire. Yeah, that's definitely alternate history. History has changed. We know Nixon didn't have that many terms uh, that they show in the newspaper. But does 2015, the part where they're saving Marty's kids in 2015, does that really count as alternate history now just because it was wrong? At the time of 1985, that was future history. That was from the, the point of view of the creators when it was created and released. Now that we've caught up to 2015 and now are just not a few more weeks left before we pass 2015 by, uh, that doesn't really make it alternate history. That just means a future prediction that got wrong. But not every prediction that got wrong. Someone just predicted the end of the world just a few weeks ago. Because they didn't that, are we now living in an alternate history? Or did their prediction in alternate history? It comes a little... It's, I don't like the fact that, I don't like the idea of alternate history just becoming a dumping ground. That's what I really don't like. I, I want it to be a separate genre of fiction. Jim? I'll get you that check. Um, alternate history, 
to be proper over its release in the way uh, a lot of people think on the subject has to have a point of divergence, a point that things happen differently from. And if you don't have that, or if you have multiple points of divergence, it's kind of cheating. Um, some people have gone ahead and said, okay, we're going to have magic. Okay. And uh, that's, uh, there's, there's various older histories, uh, or older older histories written around that sort of thing. It just depends on how strict you want your definition of it. Um, I tend to go with the more strict definition of uh, it's got to have some sort of uh, particular point that it arises from. And the simpler it is, the more correct that sort of thing is. People <coughs> need to think about it because you have to go ahead and plan this stuff out. It's not just pulling something out of your butt and saying, OK, Martians came by and made Marilyn Monroe poke. <laughs> OK. Um, that takes care of all the you know, You don't have to worry about history. You don't have to worry about anything. It's the Martians with their laser rays that made Marilyn Monroe cope. Like, that's not all our history. That's a bad joke. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I tend to agree. Um, but I think that uh, I, I, kinda, I have a little bit mixed emotions about it, um, about that, about <coughs> strictly one point of divergence. Because um, I think. Alternate history is, is to a certain extent a tool. And, and the reason why, uh, Jim, the, the uh, single point of divergence and uh, you know, making it uh, rational, why that is a good thing is that it cuts out a lot of the crap. Let's face it, it, it does. Uh, it's clean. Yeah, it, uh, and, but I think that there are other ways, uh, there are stories out there that don't adhere to that single point of divergence that also uh, can be, well, I, I, I'm special pleading because I have a, uh, a novel that, uh, nah. okay, snapshot. Uh, the idea here is that, uh, and I consider it alternate history. Basically, uh, it's, almost, uh, it's almost exactly what you said, Martian, or in this case, uh, aliens come by, and essentially they've been, for la the last, uh, since the time of the dinosaurs, they've been taking what they call, uh, they've been backing up the planet. Basically, it's like a, uh, it's like your hard drive. You don't, uh, uh, you, you back up your hard drive, well, they back up the planet. They back up Earth, and they put it in an alternate universe. And, but they back it up by continent. And so you've got, uh, you got Europe as, uh, as of 1812, right before uh, Napoleon invaded Russia. You got, uh, uh, you know, you got, North America in uh, 1953. So, and, and the, the point of that is, now this could turn into the, this big amorphous whatever, but if you take that one step of the, of the snapshot and just go straight, uh, okay, if that happened, rationally, what would happen? Nah, let's just go flying off and put, you know, put Marilyn Monroe in the presidency or whatever. Uh, just, you know, so, I think the key is rational, not necessarily that there would be one point of divergence. I also think there's occasionally, at least for, for what I make, it, uh, I'll always make an exception sometimes for bad alternate history in a book if the story itself is really good. The story's good, the characters yeah. are engaging. If I can read this and read it and not put it down, it doesn't matter. I could, in my review of it, say, oh, the alteration doesn't make any sense. There's no way it could have happened. But at the same time, you just don't read it because it's just a really yeah. good story. Uh, that being said, if you really want to find people to take it the whole one point of view seriously, you definitely need like, to read a lot of the stuff that's produced online. Just the self-published, well original work that a lot of people put on forums and other stuff. Because they really follow that whole one point of purchase rule. And if you don't, if you shy away from it, you're going to get ridiculed, you're going to get criticized, they don't like it. But the problem with those kind of works is that, well, if you like to read history books, you love reading that kind of stuff. Because that's really what it is. It's just descriptions of the history. That's it. But you don't find that many stories with characters and narrative and conflict and a beginning, middle, and end. You don't see that as something you do, but not as often as you see just massive info dumps of this nation that never existed and their entire uh, list of prime ministers and what ran against them. You get just massive amounts of data, and it's entertaining if you like that kind of stuff. It really is. And I do. I, it's, uh, I, I spend every day on it. But it's not. 
a story that's ever going to be sold. sold. That means there are exceptions. Now, for, um, for one of the now is a good example by Robert Sobel, which was literally just a history book. That was it. It was a history book where uh, the Americans used the revolution, and the former rebels moved to Texas, eventually take over Mexico, and it gets crazy on the, from an on there, but for the most part, it, it's, a, it's just a history textbook, and it's been a while since I've read it, so, but I'm pretty sure it follows the one point of divergence, because even after a while, you don't see recognizable people. There isn't Nixon selling used cars in California, because Nixon was never born. He's too far down the line, so his parents never met, or his grandparents never met, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a fascinating way of looking at history that a lot of people don't do, because as we talked about before, people want to read about famous historical characters they know. So it doesn't matter if the history that you changed was the Roman Empire you were following, uh, you'll still see Abraham Lincoln as president. It doesn't make any sense, but that's what people want to see. So and I, you've had your hand up a couple times, I'm going to try to get you. Yeah, uh, the one thing that strikes me where, where authors have missed an opportunity to write interesting alternate history is um, situations where 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 a, a, an act of violence did not uh, did not happen. Uh, for instance, uh, Tsar Alexander the Third was assassinated on the day he was about to grant Russia a constitution. And um, I I think it's a pity that nobody has ever really taken that uh, said okay we'll have it that he survives the uh, the assassination attempt uh, grants the constitution. And then you could say maybe write a family novel, three generations of Russians, as the country works its way through from being a czarist absolutism to being a constitutional monarchy. Yeah. This would be drastically different from what happened in the real world. And um, I think they, 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 I'm sure that uh, what would have happened if Lincoln had lived? Yeah. I mean, it, it, these you you got these situations where historical figures were removed violently, and nobody did that, that I've ever heard of, with the possible, the recent exception of the impeachment of, of Abraham Lincoln, has even bothered to, to, to ask the question, suppose these people would survive? Well, part of that, I think part of the problem uh, with that is that uh, story people, uh, more inter the most interesting story people are the ones in the most trouble. I mean, uh, as an author, you, you one of the um, things you absolutely have to do is you got to put your put your character in trouble, and then dig him deeper into trouble, and then throw more trouble at him. <laughs> and and so you know, yeah, from a from a <coughs> point of view of just purely analysis of uh, what would happen, I, I think you're, you're right. Those would be very big changes, and and uh, you know, certainly worthy of, of looking at, but. Yeah, like I say, uh, who's interested in, uh, in in a story without conflict, without uh, without the person having to uh, you know deal with, uh, with 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 bigger the issue, the better, really. So. Right, you know, conflict has to be like the action packed kind of conflict, where right. there's right. battles, or there's somebody who's you know rambling down our armies of men by himself. It could be just a courtroom drama. Um, although, to be fair about, like, I, that's what I hear a lot often, is that, why don't they write about this? Well, they might have. Uh, there's a good website to check out if you're interested in alternate history. It's called Ukraine, uh, U -C -H -R -O -N -I -A net. Yeah, let's go with that. Uh, and it lists pretty much every single alternate history ever published since the BC. Uh, and you, they, they even have it like listed out a really good thing and it, by its point of divergence. They have a whole timeline where it shows exactly where the story diverged on our timeline. So if you're looking for something, let's say, Lincoln surviving, not, not being assassinated, you probably will find it. In fact, I, I think of a, I can't think of the names right now, but I know their stories have been written about it. Or just look it up and try to see if someone's posted on a forum somewhere. Because like I said, AlterHistory.com, largest gathering of all alternate stories on the net. And People are constantly, constantly just publishing alternate history. Every day there's something new. One of my favorite ones is, it's probably not a very traditional alternate history, but it's one that I'm amazed by. There's this guy, and he's writing about how the story in 1984 actually came about. And he's following the theory that everything, we've, everything we're told is a lie, that the only place affected is Britain. They're like in North Korea, and they've lied to their people so much 
that they, everyone believes that they're li living in this sort of like dystopia where there's only three superpowers, but in reality, it's just that the rest of the world is fine. And it's fascinating how he plays around with early British politics and how he works in these the characters and ideas from it. And it's it's just it's it's, it's really good. And it, again, it's more like fan fiction than actual alternate history, but it shows you kind of the quality of writing that people are putting out for free. That's it. I mean, they're not trying to get money from it. They just think this is really interesting. Which is something that I, I kind of always liked about alternate historians. Uh, they don't think of themselves as fans per se. They you, they would really say that they're fans of alternate history. No, they're they create alternate history. They are creators, authors, writers, all of them. And they don't see themselves as fans of any particular person. A lot of times, you know, Turtle Dog is probably the most well-known uh, alternate history writer out there. You will hear them. They don't care about Turtle Dog. They'll put, when you ask them who's their favorite history writer, they'll name their friends on the forum over professional authors more often than not because they like their work better than what's being published. And it's it's a very interesting community. Uh, and again, I'm not involved in too many other fan communities, so I can't really compare it too much. But I would almost say it's, it's very unique in the fact that they all consider themselves creators, alternate historians, writers first before they ever consider themselves fans of alternate history. One of the, going back, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I uh, some of the same form that he, uh, Matt is, I, uh, but one of the things, kind of going back, I, I think that Lincoln, uh, no Lincoln assassination is another one of those, uh, if only, it, it leads to a lot of if onlys, because, yeah, but if only uh, Lincoln hadn't been assassinated, we would have, whatever policy in hindsight would have been best for the, for the South. And, and, yeah, whoever was president was going to fe face some really, really tough issues. Uh, you had a part of the country that really didn't want to be part of the country, and uh, uh, how do you uh, how do you protect the the interests of African Americans <coughs> in the South while not antagonizing the uh, uh, the, the people that were you know that were, that were going to become dominant in the in the South, and and that's something where. We didn't do pretty, a very good job of that, obviously. And uh, you know, could anybody have done that? Uh, could anybody have integrated the South without uh, giving them uh, more power than they really ought to have had for you know, about a hundred years over the over the lives of, of uh, African Americans? I mean, yeah, I think a lot of people like to think Lincoln would be the one to do it. But what we know from history, we know Lincoln wanted. A, quick and easy re uh, reconciliation of the towns. He wanted to make it as easy as possible. And so did Andrew Johnson, who succeeded him after he was assassinated, who many people put on the top list of worst presidents of all time. Maybe Lincoln could have ma managed to make an easy re reconciliation and still protect the rights of blacks, which we know he wanted to, or he might have pissed off the radical Republicans enough that he wouldn't be able to do anything after the war, even if he was the one who won it. Uh, I mean, it's possible. Again, you might, it might depend on who actually, you're kind of like political bias. Certainly someone who's a really Southern apologist about the Civil War probably would think of a world where Lincoln won as being pretty awful. I mean, sorry, not Lincoln won. Lincoln survived as being pretty awful because Lincoln's, in, Lincoln's the boogeyman. You don't want Lincoln being president. Yeah, I mean, think on if uh, McClellan had been all that president, because uh, it's pretty, pretty well established, he probably would have made a separate piece from the South. And if Lincoln had not been killed, he would probably modulate the uh, reconstruction quite well. It's possible. Um, again, I, I'm not sure too much about McCollum myself. I mean, he was one of those characters who I think was a better politician than he was ever a general. Yeah, I but he had the loyalty of the troops. So yeah. that being said, he definitely was a Democrat. Oh man, that's a tough one. I, I, I've always, I've seen a lot of arguments on that one. I'm, I wonder if people are putting their hands because they want to put it at their own. But I'll go you first because I'm actually reaching out to you. Um, I think the, the idea of the South, what you were saying, if, if we can, I think that one would go down to the, the river will flow regardless of what you throw up in its back because, I mean, Grant also <laughs> wanted, I mean, he was somewhat lenient in his treatment of the defeated troops, and I mean, once he defeated them, it was a little brutal for him, but, and he also wanted to protect the, the rights of the, 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 the blacks of the South, but I mean, politics and venal human desires always went through, and it, like, 
with the deal in 1876 when they withdrew the troops that were protecting the, the blacks in, in, in exchange for, well, you let us have the presidency and we'll let you go by yourself. I mean, that's just, I mean, maybe it would have, maybe the protection would have lasted a little bit longer, but. Yeah, yeah. One thing about Grant that I was like, I just said McClellan was a better politician than he was a general. Grant was definitely a better general than he was a politician. Let's, I mean, his presidency was often dominated by the same radical Republicans who wanted a tough uh, reconstruction. I mean, <sighs> Yeah, you can maybe make an argument that no matter what you change, eventually you have to pull the troops out, and eventually it's, you have to convince an entire group of people to say, yes, this other group of people deserve just as much rights as you are, despite the fact you've had generations of saying, no, they shouldn't. How do you fight that by doing it by just having one different person at, at the seat of power? It's very difficult. you got to change a lot of hearts and minds, and maybe Lincoln surviving could have done that, maybe somebody else could have done that, or maybe this is one of those situations where history is a river, and it doesn't matter who is at the seating at, at the seat of time and the Oval Office, they have no one suspected, I don't care. It doesn't matter, the same event would have played out. The details might be different, the timing might be different, but in the end, the troops would pull out, Jim Crow would come up, and it would take generations before things could get back to a somewhat even scale. And even then, someone would argue that, no, it's still not an even scale. Or he could have been brutal with the, the defeated South from the very start. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're going to, I think we only have a few more minutes, so, yeah. yep. So earlier in your comment about not desiring uh, science fiction to be, obsolete science fiction to be a dump, uh, or history to be a dumping ground, you made, at the end of that comment, you made a statement, you know, I'd like to see it to be a separate genre, you know, alternate history is different from science fiction. So are you suggesting then, for example, that a, an alternate history story that doesn't involve aliens and doesn't involve magic and doesn't involve time, time machines uh, ought not be nominated for Hugo Awards? I'm sorry, what was that last bit you said? Could I said, are you suggesting then that alternate history that's just straight divergence with no aliens, time machines, or dragons, are you suggesting then we probably ought not consider them for Hugo Awards? I have having never voted in the Hugo Awards, or I'm sad to say, cared about the Hugo Awards. I can't, I'm not the best one to actually comment on that. Dale? Oh, uh, uh, sorry. I, I think it's, uh, I think that uh, if you have a, a point of divergence, it's still history. I mean, it's still science fiction. If there's science in it, that maybe softer science than rocket ships. <coughs> but I mean, sociology, anthropology, all that stuff is science. And uh, uh, the engineering side of us kind of doesn't like to say that sometimes, but it is. Uh, so yeah, it's science and it's fiction. So it's science fiction. Pretty, pretty simple, straightforward. Yeah. Okay. I want to. Uh, Lee was the first general offered command of all northern forces before he resigned and chose to go to Virginia, so he would have been in command of troops regardless. McClellan was a better strategic general than a field general, and he actually might have had a better chance of winning the Civil War if he had fought for the South, because he understood that the South could not afford to lose troops and attacks. And finally, uh, going way back there, um, the reason we have the microwave is a um, engineer working on the uh, on the development of radar from uh, that we got from the British happened to walk in front of it one day and realize why it's chocolate bar milk. That's why we have microwaves today. And, and, and uh, how many people raise your hands can remember his name? <laughs> I was so Well. Um, I do have a, uh, uh, it's kind of a uh, mini zine slash self-promotion thing. It, uh, uh, got about 20 copies of it. Uh, I didn't kind of anticipate quite as many. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's got some decent stuff in it. Uh, it's, uh, I try to make any advertising I do useful to the people I'm giving it to. So if you want to take one, uh, yeah, it, uh, feel free. Um, yeah, I think we're done. <laughs> I'm going to say some more, but I don't want to be a long debate. <laughs>